I make sure that I don't put myself in difficult situations, but sometimes they find you. There was a, a time a while ago when I was walking back home in, in the summer and somebody just decided it was okay, it was a good idea to have a children's paddling pool party. Quite a few children there playing around. 60% of the children were naked. When you're trying so much to avoid that kind of thing and it's just, it's just there and it's, it's, it's always my fault. It's always my fault for being attracted to those children. Feel sick. Makes my stomach turn. So, you know, it's it's hard conversation to have. You okay? Yeah. Good, thanks. I wanted to say how brave you are to have to have done this, considering your background and everything, and, and what happened. And ultimately, we all want, and I mean, I hope you want the, the same thing as well. It, it's um, a world where we feel a little bit safer. Yeah, yeah. And um, for me, one of the kind of points in my life where I felt the least safe is when I knew that my dad was being released from prison. And obviously that sparks loads of questions and, you know, that's why I'm here. That's why I want to chat to you. It's about, like, like what, what can we do? Mm. Well, I don't really know how to phrase it. I was 13 when my dad was arrested for sex offences against children. He spent 10 years in prison for his crimes and part of his sentence was for crimes against me. It never will be an easy thing to talk about because you know, you're talking about your parent, like, these are the people that are supposed to protect you and, and a parent is supposed to be there for you and shelter you from the world. And you never think of, you never think of a situation where that could be the person that hurts you. While he was in prison, he did a sex offender treatment program. I don't know if it worked, um, but he was released two years ago now, and now he's just out in the community somewhere. I don't want any more victims, and I want to believe that these programs are actually working. I wouldn't want to speak with my dad now, but I can speak to other sex offenders and meet with organisations running these programmes to see what is being done and what more can be done. Hi, Andrew, are you alright? Yeah, good, thank you. Do you want to jump in? Yep. Yeah, it's cold though, isn't it? Yeah. Andrew's the first sex offender I've managed to meet, and like a lot of people who are convicted of looking at indecent images of children, he's not been to prison. I want to know if him being out in the community means he is a risk to children, and whether the treatment he's having is actually working. Basically, my criteria for where we can do this is where we can see a long distance. Sure. And we can know that, therefore, there's nobody within earshot. You said that you wrote some stuff down that you want to mm. share with me. Um, would you feel comfortable sharing those yeah, things with me yeah. now? Um, I've got one about how therapy has changed my sexuality that's quite recent. I can find it. 
Right, here we go. How therapies change my sexuality. What people forget is that paedophilia was the very definition of normal to me. I lived every day with it and as such it was my normal life. At least it was until about three months ago when all this started to change and my mind finally began to alter itself after a year in therapy. By this point my feelings for children depleted and adult attractions rapidly overtook them. I gradually had less interest in children until now when I only see them as sweet in a normal way. Now, most of the time, children just make me smile. The last thing to work on is the issue I have when I unfortunately see children naked, occasionally, usually unexpected and without warning. While it doesn't leave me sexually frustrated, it still generates much anxiety in me because I don't like to remember or see myself that way anymore. So, do you not identify as a paedophile anymore then? No. I, I identify as heterosexual these days. I filled out a form a while ago for the first time where I was able to put heterosexual rather than other, or what I would have rather put. It's complicated. Can you not be both? Could you not be heterosexual and a paedophile? Um, yeah. Um, I was essentially bisexual when it came to my paedophilia. I was interested in both boys and girls with a preference towards girls, but I didn't want that label, I didn't want that sexuality. It became apparent that I'd been through trauma myself in childhood, and anybody who's been traumatised knows that it has a profound effect on, on your mind. Um, this is the effect that it had had on me to create this, this, this sexuality that needn't have ever gotten to this point. And do you think that can come back? Um, I like to think not. Um, I think there probably is a chance of it, depending on how things happen in my life, but I'm aware of when those issues are hitting me now, and I'm pretty strong. He was saying that he had trauma as a child, so then the only way he knew growing up was then to act out. But then, actually, there are a lot of people like myself that have been abused as children that haven't gone on to do that. This idea of the abused becomes the abuser, I personally thought I just can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend knowing the pain that I felt, why you would then want someone else to feel that way, um, and just can't accept that is an excuse. I think what worries me about Andrew is that he talks about his attraction to children as a sexuality, and for me, a sexuality isn't something that you can change, even with therapy. Hello, Andrew. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Welcome back. Thank you. So, how are you? Good today, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing well. Hi. Welcome. Thank you very much. I might have to pop my wet umbrella down somewhere. When I last saw Andrew, I, I came away thinking, I don't, I don't quite know how I feel about this. He talks about these feelings that you could have that are linked to paedophilia could come from a childhood trauma in itself, is that correct? Mm, yes, there are events in the life of everyone where something can trigger and you find yourself reenacting what probably has been done to you. But uh, uh, through the work that we, we do, we try to do our best that that doesn't happen. Is the work that you're doing stopping people from offending? Yes, I'm very confident about this. Up to now, I can say 100% of my clients, they, they went through the, the big change. And not re-offended? And not, up to now, as far as I know, not re-offended. Uh, 
must be lovely. Do you think you'll have sessions forever? To some degree, um, maybe, because I'm still in the healing process and I've made so many changes and so many leaps and bounds, but there's still stuff that needs to be unravelled, still stuff that needs to be uprooted, and we're getting there. Really where we're at at the moment is me um, getting out into the world and doing normal people's stuff. I'm on a dating website now where for the first time in my life, it's exciting. And can you see yourself going on a date? Yeah, I can now. I couldn't in the past. I'm glad Andrew feels his therapy is working for him and he has changed, but I'm not totally convinced that his attractions to children have gone away, which is really worrying for me. I'd always assumed that people who looked at child abuse do it because they're attracted to children. But what I'm hearing is that's not always the case. There are people that start with the normal porn and then through becoming porn addicted, because most of the time there is also porn addiction in, in place, they want to know more, they want to see more, they want to see more and then you know, they find themselves in other situ situations through this search. And so they start to, to, to develop other interests. I've been put in touch with someone through an organisation that rehabilitates sex offenders called Safe for Living Foundation. And the person that they've put me in touch with claims that they got into looking at indecent images of children through their addiction to pornography. Hi Kyle, you alright? Hiya. Thanks so much for meeting me. Yeah, it's okay. Have you been here long? Uh, no, not long. For you, is it, was it an uh, attraction to children or was it, kind of describe that to me. So I didn't really understand at the time myself much either, but going through the rehabilitation programmes they help to get you to understand. And I worked out that it was because I was so isolated I was feeling very depressed, I'd gone through quite a bit. So I was then using imagery and harmful sexual thoughts, that kind of thing, to make myself feel good at the time. So it's not an attraction no. to ch children that you have? No, it, it was just that build up because the original stuff that I was looking at wasn't effective anymore so I then moved on to the next step and moved on to something slightly worse and something slightly worse until it reached that point because that was what was giving me the adrenaline rush at the time. D did it ever occur to you that should I be looking at this? I knew it was wrong but when you're in that moment you don't think rationally. regret the offence in yes. the first place? Yes, yeah. A lot of people don't see the victims, particularly when all you've done is click on an image on a computer. But w what you learn and what you understand is that there is someone that has been abused to create that image. And as such, by creating the demand for it, you're increasing demand for more images to be made. And there are victims and I will live the rest of my life knowing that I've helped to create that demand for people to be abused. I've been invited along to one of Kyle's sessions to understand how his treatment works. And if what he's saying is true, then he's been through a massive change 
but I, I don't know, I'm, I'm still a bit sceptical about it. It's surreal, isn't it? It's bowling with a sex offender. It just feels a bit strange. Because it's a proper family place as well, bowling, isn't it? It's where you come with your friends and your family and it's intimate. I think that's what's so uncomfortable about it. It's just so intimate. Close. How does it feel doing something like this? It just feels really natural and it just feels really friendly. I suppose some people would say, you know, it, it's just bowling. So some people, sure, they might go out all the time with friends, but for me it's completely different because um, that's not something I would have normally done. I would have been just at home in my flat. So going out to a bowling alley with complete strangers all around you, oh. a couple of years ago it would have been my biggest fear ever. I would have hated that. Is it just as simple as getting rid of isolation? I think it's that, and it's also you talk more when you're comfortable. So if I've got something going on in my life, being in this kind of environment, it's easier to then talk to the volunteers about it. There are people in the street that are going to be sex offenders and you wouldn't have a clue who they are because they're an ordinary person. And just because a, a range of situations has happened in their lives, that they've done something, doesn't mean that they are a risk. Sex offenders are out there, and even the ones that do go to prison, like my dad, are at some point released. And I don't know if these people are safe. Like, should they be in our community? When my dad was released, like, I've never felt fear like that in that I didn't, I just didn't feel safe. I'm still questioning how treatment like Kyle's actually works and how having sex offenders out in the community is actually stopping them from offending. So I'm going to meet the person that runs the Safer Living Foundation and hopefully she can give me more clarity. So, are we heading to your office? Yes. Do you get worried then, you know, coming in? Yeah, sometimes I will. Um, <laughs> I am like, I can be looking behind me. Um, oh, it's serious, isn't it? Like... The reason we're doing this is not just about kind of decency or or of humanity, etc. The, the, the main reason is, is about preventing further offences. We've dealt with, I think, nearly 60 high risk, very high risk uh, individuals, and I think to date we have just had one person re offend. How do you rehabilitate those kind of people? It's giving them a place in society, and it, it's perhaps the most difficult thing to do because no one wants to know people and no one wants to make a, a space for these people in society but that's exactly what you need to do if you want to keep them off that path to um, offending and so we are really looking to improve people's well-being reduce their social and emotional isolation find them something kind of meaningful to do during their days Shall we start with kind of where you feel like you were at at the time that you were offending? Yeah, sure. Okay. And what about healthy sexual interests? 
Well, naturally, um, at the time then, no. I didn't have healthy sexual interest, I think, so I'd probably put it at a zero. With the things that have happened before you to support these different areas, where are we now? I'd definitely say there's been some improvement with this. I'm not watching in decent images anymore, but I've not had a relationship on a romantic level with anyone since the offence. So I think that's the ground that's not really been tested. You liked him, didn't you? I did like him. Um... It's quite, it's quite a, a confusing feeling, um, and I don't know if I like myself very much for saying that. Feels safer because he's got that support around him, but then what happens when that goes? Like he said that he offended because he was alone and he felt depressed, but what's stopping that from reoccurring once he leaves the programme? I'm wondering what support would look like for people away from organisations and people in other types of relationships. After weeks of discussion on the phone and meetings, I've managed to get a partner of a sex offender to speak with me on camera. But I can't get my head around how could she stay with someone who's committed such horrendous crimes. I don't know. I don't think I could do that. Hi, you OK? Thank you for coming to see me. No problem. Nothing can really um, prepare you for that knock on the door. It was really early in the morning. My boyfriend had gone to work. I thought, oh, is this... He's, he's not paid his TV licence or something like that. To, to then be asked about whether I knew of a, a particular chat site he was using. I'd never even heard of a chat site. It felt like I'd been betrayed, you know. There was a lot, I didn't know, a lot of awful stuff there that I didn't know. I knew he watched porn. Normally I wouldn't, I'd say having a partner who looks at porn is a, a problem wasn't affecting our relationship, but I didn't realise it was the extent where it was deemed an addiction. Even that in itself, the porn addiction is a hard thing to come to terms with, let alone um, anything else. And then everything the police said was a real shock. Talk me through when you got the um, findings back from the police. What, what did they find? When we got the results, it was, as Chris had said, it was hundreds of images. It wasn't thousands. Is that child? Yeah. yeah. So it's still it's still a lot by maybe our standards, but I guess you know, I had it was you know they're going to find thousands and thousands, um, and I really I suppose it shouldn't make a difference how much it was, but it was maybe uh, how much I could trust Chris, I suppose. Um, you know, if if he was saying, oh no, there were fifty, and then there were fifty thousand, it was like, well, we really don't have a future if I can't trust you. What would you say would be the thing that made you, you stay with him? It's a hard one to answer. Um, he's still the person that you loved, but at the same time, they've also done this terrible thing. I uh, guess um, understanding the context more, that it, it came from a porn addiction rather than any desire to do anything to, to children. I don't think you can trust someone that's committed a sexual offence. I think with that label of sex offender and committing a sexual offence, that trust is completely gone. I have never had contact with my dad since, nor would I want to. Because um, I could never separate the person from, you know, the crime that he's committed um, and I suppose that there are some people that might have been able to do that and might have been able to see past that crime but you know that's 
all I'll ever see now. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have a relationship with him. I just can't get past that. Hello, are you okay? Hiya. How are you both? Good. I've got a, a bit of a walk for us today, so we're not around public and it's a bit more discreet. That's good. I don't know, I just felt terribly ashamed. I do consider myself, I think, a good person. It's not the kind of thing I would do in real life. And I, um, I didn't really know... I think that's hard for people to comprehend, isn't it? That yeah, well, it's hard for me to comprehend. I think that people would automatically assume, because you've looked at that, that you... You came up in the police interview, actually. Uh, in a way, really, how can you say no? You know, how can you just deny it? Just look at the internet history. I think there was some, some... Sorry, when you said I've got to say no with the internet history... Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, what I mean is that, you know, if, if you were to look at my internet history and, and look at everything I've been watching, uh, it might be difficult to, 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 to sort of say, um, no, I don't have, have that interest, if you get my meaning. Right. But then I, I don't have an interest in 90% of the porn. I, I don't want to do any of that stuff. Um, does that make sense? Um, so that's, that's what I tend to... That's, that's, that's the best explanation I, I can generally give. Um, I, I don't want to reenact bondage, for instance, or, or loads of different types of porn that I've seen, uh, including, um, including children, of course. The thing is, though, there is a difference between porn and indecent images. That's real people that aren't consenting, that are being abused. Yeah, absolutely. But they're all out there on the free internet, on chat sites that anybody can access. But I suppose what it's, I've struggled with is that you've seen that as porn. Yeah, you put that as an extension sure. to porn, which... And that's what I struggle with. I didn't even consider myself um, addicted to porn, um, which is what led, you know, to me viewing more and more extreme porn, which puts you in orbit of less legal things on the internet. And how do you st stop that from happening again, you know, like, if it, it, as an addiction? The key is, obviously, um, not looking at porn, basically. Completely cold. cold. Cold turkey, really, I think. And I think the best way, uh, it's only way for me, is a blocker. Like, something that a parent would use on the child's phone. Knowing that I don't have access to it, just um, takes a lot of the um, craving away. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Are you okay? Yeah, I guess. Um, I just feel a little sad, a little bit angry, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I'm scared that you haven't taken responsibility enough on camera. Haven't. In terms of. There hasn't been that acknowledgement of that fueling the abuse. Mm. Like, well, you've got to yeah. say what you feel. I can't put that in, but... Well, yeah, that's something that bothers me. It's, um, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, that fuels those offences, you know, which is something that bothers me a lot. She's chosen to stick by him, so, you know, on the outside, that's, you know, it's a massive statement. You obviously love this person, you know, people don't love monsters, so to see cracks in that and for me to be sat here questioning that makes me feel a bit of a bad person, to be honest. I suppose I want to know, how does a relationship like that survive? Like, he says he's not attracted to children and Chris has been dealing with what he calls his addiction, but he has been viewing child abuse images and it just leaves you wondering like 
what would happen if Vicky wasn't around. Do you think if it wasn't for Vicky, there could have been a relapse? Well, in those earlier weeks, months, yeah, very much so, because I was very close to, you know, losing you, and there would have been a big gap that could have been filled by going back to bad habits. I suppose I'm still on guard, so uh, the future isn't sort of clear cut. No, no, absolutely not. I'm hopeful, but realistic that there are those effects, those considerations. That's, Do you have any worries about the future at all? Because with an addiction, there can be relapses. Yeah. Does that scare yeah. you? Um, there was one time when it scared me, because since all this, um, to my knowledge, he has looked at porn once, and I, I was furious. And particularly, he seemed a bit blasé when he said it, and I kind of hit the roof. That felt quite a betrayal. Um, you know, he didn't look at anything legal, but just to look at that was... <sighs> What is your future? Um, so neither of us want children anyway. But um, that's that's before obviously. the offence? Yeah, yeah. But I do remember maybe thinking, actually, that I would have preferred to have had the choice of whether I want children, whereas now I feel like, well, it's not an option. The other factor, I suppose, is, is getting married, and if we were to get married, there's the question of who will come. And even if certain people did come, they maybe don't want to be there. So it would be a very small wedding, I'm afraid. Even though, personally, I wouldn't have made that same decision to stick by my partner, she has, and actually, you can see that he is grateful and, and it's done him a world of good, and he hand on heart admits that he doesn't know where he'd be if it wasn't for her which is really reassuring to hear, but then also it's kind of tainted with that. If you didn't have Vicky, then maybe you would reoffend. I know from my experience, I wouldn't want to have any kind of relationship with a sex offender. So I don't know how realistic the idea of having people around them to stop them from reoffending is. And there are people like Andrew who don't have people around him, but wants them. And I don't really understand how this would work for someone like him. He says that his attraction to children has gone away. And now he's talking about dating. But I, I don't really understand, like, is he really not a risk anymore? We haven't spoken in properly in, is it, two weeks? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to say that, you know, I'm, I'm now messaging some women on... Well, I've not had any, uh, any replies yet, but I've messaged uh, a few women on, um, on the dating website I'm on. I'm just waiting and seeing and keeping on going with it. Um, Obviously, there's nothing about this issue on there at, at this point. Um, when it comes to disclosure, I don't know when the best time is. I don't want to be too upfront about it and give away too much early on because I can push them away. But I don't want to wait until a long time into the relationship because then it'll feel like a betrayal. But I also don't want to find that I'm falling in love with somebody and then tell them about my pasts, only to find that I'm, I lose a relationship because of it. My whole life I've been trying to build to, to, to get to the point where I could have dates and find a relationship and find love and I've always wanted to have a wife and I've wanted a family since before any of this happened. It's been far, far more to my feelings towards children than just sexual attraction.
when I used to be at home when I was alone, I would uh, regress into, say, a toddler age, which is kind of when everything really happened in my childhood. Um, and uh, I will be like a like like a toddler. So I could I, I could be I could be naked and I could be sitting on the floor playing with with toys or watching the the Moomins or um or um Pingu or something like that. Uh, so I have cuddly toys and I'll play with cuddly toys and um, um, have even things like dummies and stuff like that. Um, strange as it sounds for an, an, an adult man to be to be like that, but that's just that's, that's regression. So this is a coping mechanism. Yeah, and it's about trying to create a personality in your mind that is more able to cope with than you are. Do you think there's a link between the regression and offending? Um, or think, is there a link? I sorry? think there is a link between that and the sexuality. Um, I think the, the offending is something that came about later on. Um, I don't think that's intrinsically linked. Explain it to me. I think because I was locked as a child, when I hit adolescence and my hormones were going crazy and brain saying, oh, well, you need to have a sexuality, and, and you still feel like, like a child, you feel like a three-year-old. Ultimately, you identify more with the childhood part of you than you do with the adult or, you, you know, whatever, a 12-year-old or the, 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 the teenager, the, the tween or whatever you want to call it these, these days. Um, and I think it makes sense that the sexuality came about because I felt like a three-year-old child locked in an adult's body it makes sense that my mind would say, right, I feel like children are my peers and I'm gonna be attracted to my peers. We'll drive somewhere else, if that's okay, and then carry on talking, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. When I get my cuddly toy out, uh, if you want me to, um, um, if he can be blurred as well. Sure, okay. This is uh, this is Buzz, and he's been my friend, my friend for a, a long time. He, he he has a personality to me. He's he might be an inanimate object to a lot of people, but to me he's he's meant the world, and there's been nobody else there, as as have all my other cuddly toys. Um, many a night that I've fallen asleep with him in my arms. Um, generally, I sleep a lot better when I've got a cuddly with me. What other teddies um, do you have then? I've got lots. I've probably got. I think I've got about mid 40s. Some of them are a lot bigger than this guy. And they're all comforting to me. Some people might think it's a bit odd, but I don't really care. There's a lot more about me that's odd than that. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much. See you. How'd you feel after that one? I suppose it's just a coping mechanism. Like, what's more concerning for me is the fact that he says his attractions are gone. Like, personally, it feels risky and it's always been in the back of my mind with him. Like, how can he truly move on and build a normal life? I just, I don't know if I should be worried about him. I'm going to meet Belinda again, um, because she deals with sex offenders with all types of convictions, and she's done all sorts of research into these types of crimes, so I'm hoping that she'll be able to make me feel better about the people that I've met. Hello. <laughs> if you have committed that sexual offence against a child, will you always have that attraction if you do? Is there a way to get rid of that attraction? For people who commit a sexual offence against a child, some 
of these uh, will have a sustained sexual interest in children where they have never really been attracted to adults. I think that is probably unlikely to change, but that does not mean to say that they cannot have a happy, successful sexual relationship to relationships with adults as well. It just means that's their preference, as it were. If someone came to you and they said that, that they um, did have an attraction to children and they said that actually that attraction has gone now and they denied having that anymore even though they did identify as a paedophile in the first place, would that raise flags for you? We wouldn't really be trying to take that apart, I guess. What we would be keen to do uh, is for, you know, for the person to feel comfortable uh, and well and settled with themselves. We want people to, if they have got sustained and enduring attraction to children, you know, to accept that um, because not accepting it maybe that's when they go down this slippery slope whereas if they say actually you know what this this has always been my attraction and that's something they can live with then the support service can help them live with that in a safe and careful way I guess we we always assume that people who commit sex offences have no control whatsoever when in fact everyone has control over their actions When you think of sex offenders, like, that is one of the most horrific crimes. And, you know, that's, that's really hard to get your head around because you could never imagine yourself, you could never put yourself in that position or put yourself in their shoes where you would commit a sexual offence. I'll never understand why my dad did what he did. And I suppose there's part of me that will always question it, but, you know, the truth is that I'll just never know and I'll never understand it. I do believe that everybody has a choice and these people have chosen to do what they've done. But with the same breath, I think that there are some people who just have these attractions that they have and have these sexual urges and are driven by them and that's just who they are. And I don't know if that's something that can be changed. So I've been speaking to this organisation who rehabilitates sex offenders um, and they've actually introduced me to someone who's taking medication to lower his risk of reoffending. There you go. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been a, a problem pretty much from childhood. I got bullied a lot in school, so there was very little contact of a pleasant nature with my peers. Um, it came about that I exposed myself at school and the girls were of a similar age to me. Um, we would have been sort of eight, nine, something like that. And their reaction was surprising to me because they actually showed some interest. Like, probably just natural curiosity at that age, I would guess, but because that was the only pleasant interaction I'd had with peers, it kind of got a bit embedded. As an adult, um, nobody ever saw me unzip or anything, and I'd simply walk past my victims as if not being aware of the fact that I was exposed. The penis was flaccid, so because I was only in their presence for a few seconds, um, by the time the reaction would have set in, I was long gone, so I never saw I never saw it, so all the way through, although I knew it was wrong, I never saw any harm being caused by it. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until I actually read the victim statements that I realised that this is no good, that I'm, I'm actually distressing people here. What was that like, reading the victim statements? That was very scary. Uh, I didn't see myself as a person who was capable of causing distress to other people. Was it ever for sexual gratification? 
Yeah, I mean, it was mostly about stress relief, to be honest. But uh, yes, I would masturbate to the memories of it. So there was some sexual gratification retrospectively, if you, if you like. I was very preoccupied with sex, so it was, it was difficult to focus on ordinary things. It just means that instead of being completely preoccupied, it's like I, it's hardly relevant anymore. So the sexual desire is almost, I mean, it's a little bit there, but it's totally manageable. Um, whereas before it was at levels where I was masturbating at such a frequency that there wasn't really time or energy to do anything else. Okay, so this is the medication I use. It's the standard um, SSRIs, serotonin, reuptake inhibitors, which usually prescribe for Antidepressant. antidepressants, yeah. yeah. I know a number of other people have struggled to be able to get these prescribed for what they want them for. And in some cases, people have actually had to go to the GP and claim to have depression, even if they don't, just in order to get their pills prescribed. Jonathan's on the medication that seems like it's really helping. It's lucky that he has it, but also scary that he might not always have it because it's clearly what he needs. He looks like he is really remorseful and he, he feels regret for what he did, which makes me feel better. It's been, you know, over 10 years now. Um, And I've never, you know, I've never had the opportunity to question if there's that remorse there with my dad. And I'm at a point where I've accepted that I'll never get that remorse um, from him. And, you know, and that's probably why I didn't feel safe when he was released, because, you know, I don't know if he regrets what he's done. Um, and with that, there is no trust. And I'll never know if he still is a risk or could do it again. And as horrific as that is, and I wish that that wasn't the case, I've just got to accept that. It's difficult with Andrew. He always seems to blame other people, and to me, it seems like he's still battling his attraction to children want him to show me that he's acknowledging his crimes. It's it's easy to say, oh, oh just don't offend. It's easy to say, oh, just, just go out for a, for, a, for a run to put your mind off it every time. It's easy for people to say, just don't do it, when, when they've had a normal attraction and they've been able to do just whatever they want from the start. I could have lived until I was 80, had this attraction and never done anything with it. And I would still, the entire time, would have been treated like a monster. For all the years, and there's, there's quite a small period in my life when I was offending, and the rest of the time, according to the people out there, I was always an abuser. And that's the problem with distinctions that, that, that are not being made, is that actually there's a big difference between having an attraction and abusing. Just like, just like there's a big difference between being a heterosexual and being a rapist. It's, it's not the same thing. But I suppose when, you know, in people's eyes, as soon as you offend, you kind of lose the right in a way to say, but what about all the times that I didn't offend? But I've, I've covered how. I can kind of see where you're coming from, but, but at the same time, where, where, where was I to go? I, how much I tried to fight it. It's not about where you would go. I suppose people would just argue just, you just don't have to offend. I think if you have a stronger mind to begin with and are able to keep that from happening, then that's fine. Yes, I am to blame, but 
there are also many other situations and many other people up until that point who were to blame for the pieces of the puzzle falling into place for, the, for, for that to happen. And I hear that. I, I, I do. I hear that. I, I, I just... What worries me a little bit is you're almost blaming other people for you offending, and that worries me. And I, think, I, I, I just want, you know, that you... you do you, well, do you feel the remorse, or is, oh, is yeah. there a shame? Yeah. Or oh, is... oh, yes, I, I did what I did, and I, I hate it. I hate that I did it. And I'm not making excuses for it. I'm, I'm telling you what led up to that. Sometimes the way that you talk about it does look like you don't have remorse, though. And I want, I want I to want challenge to you on that. that. Way. Yeah. I want to challenge yeah. on that because I don't... Like, if you do feel remorse, I don't want you to come yeah. across like I you suppose don't. I spent so much of my time being remorseful of myself and actually... I'm, I'm feeling now, I'm at a time now where I want to stand up and say, look, in order for people to stop doing these things and in order for people to, 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 to get better, they have to be helped. And at the moment, we're waiting to blame them for something. If you think that people in my situation are a threat to children, why are you throwing them out the door when they're coming to you telling them that they've got that? And it's, it's just, it's, it's insane. It's, it's completely insane that they're just ignored and then you're, uh, oh, oh, they've gone off and, and done something bad. Whoa, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> well, you fucking did, because I, I fucking told you, I told you, I told you, I told you, I told you. I, I, I told loads of people and nobody gave a shit. The whole of society has the wrong way of looking at these things. You need to find a balance between caring for the children who, who might be under threat and caring for the person to help them to get better. I'm treated like a predator, but in reality, I'm, I've always been much closer to a victim. It's called empathy, isn't it? And nobody empathises with us because they see us as evil. I do think that he does feel shame for what he's done, and I do think that he is sorry for what he's done, but I think that that also doesn't come across when he's saying, I take responsibility, but... Because there has to be a point where you just say, when it really boiled down to it, I decided to do that, and it, it is my fault. I'm just frustrated. Like, I'm not angry. I'm not angry at him. It's just... It's a horrible subject. After a while, it just becomes really, really draining. I, to be honest, I don't know what I expected. Like, you know, was I naive to think that <laughs> talking to sex offenders would make me feel better? I don't know, probably, but... That's where I'm at. There are people like my dad who I don't know if they can change. I think there are probably some that with the right people around them and the right support won't reoffend. And and I do feel safer knowing that there are organisations out there who are trying to rehabilitate sex offenders. But I just question if it's enough. I think that there'll always be some that have these attractions and have these sexual urges, and those are the people society turn their back on. Those are the people that we want nothing to do with, and they could reoffend. And that's a terrifying thought.